Welcome to DABCC Radio, where smart people listen. Virtualization and Cloud Talk, featuring cutting-edge solutions from the hottest companies around the globe. Broadcasting from the DABCC offices in sunny Sarasota, Florida. Surrounded by computers, books, and Legos. Your host, Douglas Brown. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of DABCC Radio. We have a great show for you today. We have Mike Walsh from NetApp with us. And Mike um, was formerly with Cloud Jumper, and you guys might be familiar with them, and you're definitely familiar with NetApp. And recently, NetApp acquired Cloud Jumper, so we are bringing Mike on to share that story. You know, first of all, a bit about what Cloud Jumper did, now what NetApp is going to do with it, and much more. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, very big acquisition in our space and really interesting to uh, interested in learning all about it. So on that note, here's my interview with Mike Walsh from NetApp. Okay, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I, I'm quite looking forward to this this conversation. This has been a long time coming, and I, I wanted to have, Cloud, I have Cloud Jumper on. I've known Rob and Brindle for years and decades, actually. So uh, I'm, I'm sort of uh, I'm sad I never did that. But uh, now we have a great reason to bring you on because you guys are just recently acquired by NetApp, and, oh, the world's changing. So that being said, before we get too far ahead, um, you know, first of all, thank you for being here. Sure. Uh, yep. And second is, uh, which is always my first question, is sort of who is Mike Walsh and what do you do over at NetApp? Uh, well, thanks for having me, uh, Doug, to, to start with. Uh, so my name is Mike Walsh. Um, I work in the, what is the new modern workplace group at NetApp focused on uh, end user computing and applications that um, sort of are attached to that. And I run our uh, product strategy group and our solution architect. So pretty much everything that uh, has to do with defining the, the future of the product, uh, but then also making sure that we help our customers and partners get it implemented um, as we go into, into enterprises. Perfect. Perfect. And uh, so, you, you know, you guys used to be Cloud Jumper, and a lot of the, the folks out there listening might have heard of the name Cloud Jumper. Of course, they've heard of NetApp, right? But Correct. when you think when you think of NetApp, you don't think EUC, you think storage, right? It's a, and so when NetApp acquired Cloud Jumper, it quite quite uh, um, surprised me. But I, I guess I'm getting my head of myself. Uh, first and foremost, can you tell us a bit about NetApp EUC? This is new for them. Well, it's uh, it's an evolution, I think. Um, as everybody in the end user community knows, storage is always an important element of any of the solutions huge, that we huge. run on. Um, a performance, user profile performance come to the top of mind for anything that we're, we're dealing with. Um, so NetApp has been around the space for a, a large number of years and people uh, have used the, the NetApp products uh, mostly in private data centers um, and then uh, on-prem as well. And then they moved uh, recently, the last probably three or four years, they've also been moving their storage expertise in the cloud. So I think they've been what I would call EUC adjacent for a long time, um, but they, uh, that, you know, they, they definitely have a uh, well understood and well respected uh, set of IP and knowledge around the storage layer in all these different environments. So um, they're not that foreign to the industry, but they've always been one of those enabling technologies. You bet. Well, storage, I mean, virtualization really is what, I mean, storage has always been important, of course, right? But when virtualization came around, it sort of put storage into high gear uh, because, you know, we needed more of it in different locations, right? And, uh, yeah, so uh, I actually had a friend there. I have a good friend that works over, used to work at NetApp. I think he still does. I forget. I guess he's not the good of a friend if I don't know where he works. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, why did NetApp buy Cloud Jumper? Well, I think it's the sort of the continuation of the story. Uh, as I said, about probably four years ago now, NetApp uh, looked around and said they're, you know, that they, they understood that a lot of the uh, partners and customers that they were working with were starting to make the uh, decision to migrate uh, at least some of their workloads to the clouds. Um, and if you think about the clouds in general, their their storage knowledge is mostly on a, uh, generic is probably too strong a word, but it's, it's pretty much one size fit all uh, type thing. There isn't a lot of differentiated uh, a prioritization of, of storage loads and things like that. So NetApp felt they had some 
knowledge to bring to that equation um, and started working on, on those relationships. And if you think about it today, looking at moving forward today, uh, they have products like Azure NetApp files, which are very popular in the WVD community. Um, and then on the Google Cloud, uh, Cloud Volume Service is also sort of its cousin um, in that uh, cloud as well. Um, and that exposure sort of led uh, NetApp to the conclusion that there's more um, to just managing components in the cloud. It's more trying to optimize um, each, each one of those lower level components for uh, particular workloads. And that sort of led to the, um, uh, the relationship. At first on a partnership side, um, we'd been using Azure NetApp file uh, storage at Cloud Jumper for over a year because we realized the dependency there for Windows Virtual Desktop. Um, but as we've, you know, uh, on the Cloud Jumper side, started working towards having a consistent solution, uh, NetApp at the same time was looking at it and saying, okay, beyond just storage, what are some of the workloads, what's some of the optimization uh, that we should bring to the market? And it turned out that uh, while they were looking at that, they, they basically made the, you know, came to the same conclusion we did on the Cloud Jumper side, that to optimize end user computing, you really sort of need to control um, the deployment of the, uh, the choices on the EUC stack uh, all the way ba uh, back through the storage. Um, and that's not just a end user story. Um, for those who are, are following the NAP uh, team, uh, Project Astra is doing pretty much the same thing in the Kubernetes container space. Um, and then NetApp just uh, about 10 days ago announced uh, the intent to acquire a company called Spot that does uh, compute optimization. Uh, so it really sort of fits into this big framework. The, the phrasing that uh, the company's using is called application-driven infrastructure. And what that really translates into is if I have a particular workload like end user computing, I wanna make sure that as I do the automation of deploying that and managing that, that I'm optimizing all the services on the public clouds um, that sort of constitute the, the full solution. Because uh, if the big cloud pro, you know, providers, they're very um, good at giving you a set of services that you sort of have to put together, um, sort of like putting a bicycle together on Christmas Eve. Um, and from the NetApp point of view, it should really be more application uh, driven or use, uh, use case or, or workload driven uh, application where you bring a couple of the services together. So sometimes that's going to be NetApp products. Um, sometimes that's going to be NetApp products plus other products. Um, and sometimes we're, you know, we're going to be a minor player in somebody else's solution. But we think there's a, a real next generation of cloud management here to optimize the, uh, the, all the you know, parts and pieces, especially storage. And now with the spot acquisition, um, optimizing compute as well. Ah, that makes total sense. Makes total sense. Um, can you talk a bit about, uh, for those who aren't familiar with what Cloud Jumper brought to market, can you talk a bit about the NetApp Cloud Jumper solution? Sure. So our, um, uh, our focus was pretty much along those lines. Um, while there's a lot of different solutions, RDS, WVD, uh, Citrix and VMware are also out there, obviously. Uh, but our idea was to uh, automate the process of provisioning and managing uh, these specific end user virtual desktop solutions. Um, and that really focused first on the private data centers. We've been around for almost 20 years before we got acquired, um, but then moved to the public clouds. And then three or four years ago, um, we spent some time with the Microsoft, what was the RDMI team um, and became the WVD team. And we were part of the, uh, the Tech Preview Zero for that. So um, from our perspective, there are a lot of um, solid components for uh, providing virtual desktop. And the last three or four months have shown there's a, a pretty good demand for it now. Um, but to, combining those two has been challenging for folks. Um, putting together one of these environments has been complex pretty much as long as they've been around. Um, and we're trying to take some of the complexity out, but at the same time, give administrators the capability to admit, you know, administer these and manage these environments from a remote setting, uh, because it's not, uh, not true that you're down the, you know, down the hall from the server room anymore, and you're probably not down the hall from the end users right now. Uh, they're working from their house or a restaurant or a coffee shop or something like that, um, and you're administering it from, uh, from your machine uh, through a browser somewhere. So um, combining the capability of managing a wide variety of environments, um, but at the same time also understanding these are still end users. There's still you know, troubleshooting to be done, still applications to be updated. Uh, the combination of those components are what really drive the, uh, the product vision for, for uh, virtual desktop service. You got it. You got it. You sort of mentioned it, but not by name. Is uh, of course we're in the middle of this COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, how do you see this? Is have, have you seen this change? Um, you know what you guys are doing, uh, maybe from development or or uh, de definitely just sales and marketing and the whole nine yards. You know what? What are the customers saying? You know things of that nature. Yeah, I think there's been a couple waves, and if you talk to anybody in, in our industry, um, there was the February, March, especially in the States, but I think around Europe, might have been a yeah. little bit earlier, um, but now it's spread out pretty much uh, globally. Uh, the first approach was, okay, I need an immediate solution, whether it's um, enhancing my existing virtual desktop structure, uh, using VPN where you could, 
uh, pretty much everybody put together whatever they had um, in the first couple of months of that, went out and you know found new solutions or deployed solutions rapidly. But now I think we're sort of in a pause where everybody's taking a step back and saying, okay, if my, you know, let's say 10% of my organization used to work remotely, um, and then automatically it went to, you know, 85% in less than a month. Uh, we're probably not going to stay at 85%, which is a good thing. It'd be good, good to you know, get back in the, the office and see our colleagues and travel again and see each other. Um, but I think it's going to be somewhere in between. So whereas it was a, you know, sort of a emergency implementation this past spring, we're looking at a long-term implementation where I think scale is one of the big elements. You know, is it 10%? Is it 40%? Is it 50%? We're not sure probably for the next couple of years. Um, and even going forward, I think it's opened some people's eyes that remote work is not this this thing that only a you know, small few people could do. There's a, there's a lot of productivity available and some of the strengths of the modern virtual desktop solutions have really gotten highlighted in this process. Uh, so I think people are going to deal with scale and then we're still dealing with security. The, you know, let's not fool ourselves. This was a very good opportunity for the malware and, and hacker guys to take a look at this and say, okay, who's identifying themselves as having ports open and access Access points that they're going to file away, um, and then you know attack with sophisticated tools as they you know as they continue to make them those attacks you know stronger and stronger. We have to be aware that security is still going to play an element in this. So I think the the organizations that are doing this on a long term planning basis are looking at security. They're looking at access you know scalable access as, as I just talked about, um, but they're also worried about cost right because you can't make the solution four times as expensive as having somebody physically in the office. So I think those are the big drivers we're seeing. I think it's a much much longer term. Um, plan, um, but we used to joke that, you know, EUC used to be, you know, somewhere in the top 50 in most CIOs objective list, um, but we were a solid number 43. And I think uh, it's safe to argue that we're probably in the top five for a lot more folks this year. So, um, you know, silver lining, I guess, in that respect. You got it. You got it. I say it's always sort of bittersweet that uh, uh, this happened, right? It's, it's definitely not what we wanted. Anybody wanted. It's a, you know, it's a horrible thing. But at the same time, uh, I firmly believe that EUC is a better way to compute. Uh, it's not just about work from home. It's about work from anywhere. And like you said, more productive in the whole nine yards. But uh, Yeah, we use the term remote work because you're right. It's yeah. not just work from home. It's work from a lot of different settings. Um, and we're yeah. hearing from companies now that are sort of reevaluating um, one of the side effects that we don't think about, there are a lot of industries where they went from one shift to three shifts because they're trying to produce quantity of goods that, you know, that went into shortage in various parts of the world. And if you have three people sharing the same physical workstation on the manufacturing floor, you know, that's not something the security officer is really thrilled about because you're not sure who's doing what. Whereas the virtual desktop is that where all the, you know, all the identity um, is, is stored, all the important applications are accessed. If you can put that into a virtual setting, then everybody can share a physical device um, to do that. The other end of that, I think it's, you know, it's opened some people's eyes in terms of what devices. I mean, uh, I think the Agile products are, have gotten a second look in a lot of places because people are like, well, wait a minute, I don't necessarily need a full blown, you know, Lenovo laptop in every one of these situations. If my whole goal is to make somebody productive, I, I think the situation has really driven some, um, some reevaluation of what it means to be, uh, to have access to applications and data and where you have to do and how you have to do that, uh, that particular process. So I think it's, it's, it's definitely changed the, our, our industry and probably for the better in a lot of cases. I, I, I firmly, I, I 100% agree with you, 100% agree with you. So now that Ed, NetApp has bought CloudJumper, um, does, does that change anything? You know, uh, um, what changes? I think uh, from our perspective, from the CloudJumper side, the, the big change for us is we have access to some of the components that we had to um, think about but couldn't execute on because of our size and then also our accessibility. And just to you know, give you an example, we started with Azure NetApp Files. Um, uh, NetApp also acquired a com company called Talon. Uh, they have a global file cache solution that's very useful for when we're looking for companies that they're trying to, you know, follow guidelines and, and get uh, their virtual desktop virtual machines as close to the users as they can. So if they have clusters in Europe and a cluster in North America, maybe another cluster in, in Asia, they want to create those regional uh, instances for virtual desktops, um, but you have people that might float between those. Some, you know, some managers or some uh, rep, you know, representatives might float between those locations. And having that user profile move isn't something that we have the capability to do. Um, but with Global File Cache, we do. Um, the other element of it is that um, the product line is really well thought out for um, being able to, to to keep tabs on the whole environment. Uh, the Cloud Insights product does a really good job of collecting data, so we're working hard on integrating with that uh, because one of the feedback elements we've gotten in a year of working with WBD specifically is that they want, you know, the, the customers want better uh, feedback loops for troubleshooting, for analyzing how much they're spending, uh, for seeing how the, the environment's performing. Um, all those capabilities, you know, we have the current state of that in 
the old Claw Jumper, now the VDS product, um, but now we're going to have the ability to, to forecast that over long periods of time. We can show people, hey, based on what you've chosen, this is what the results are, you know, user experience cost and, and then sort of resource consumption. Um, now we can show you over a month, hey, this is, this is changing and for some reason Wednesdays are a bad day, right? So let's, let's look at what's going on on Wednesday um, and, and try and figure some of that out. So I think we're, we're talking about mat, uh, maturation of end user computing overall, but now being part of the NetApp family of products allows us to take advantage of, of a larger tool set to start answering some of those questions. You got it. You have a new name too, right? Yeah, so um, so Cloud Jumper and Cloud Workspace Management Suite, or CWMS, is now virtual desktop service. Um, I've I've got almost gotten to a point where I don't use uh, the Cloud Jumper or CWMS names in any briefings or demonstrations or something like that. So it's taken a couple of months, but I'm I'm pretty close to getting all the initials correct. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the the virtual desktop uh, service is in the modern workplace family of products. So I think I've mentioned Cloud Insights. We we draw on that. Um, the uh, uh, global file cache is one of our products. And then um, I didn't know this before I started, but NetApp actually has a Office 365 uh, backup product as well. Um, so that's gonna be one of the products that'll be in our um, collection of, of products under modern, modern workplace. Because if you think about it, if you're trying to protect data, um, NetApp has at least, I think five or six different data backup, data protection compliance tools. Um, but the one hole in that is if you want a versioned backup of your office, um, you know, your Word files, your team files, all that type of stuff, um, then the SAS backup team um, also does that. So I think we've covered the, the data protection waterfront um, here at NetApp. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so I'll try to use the new name. It might be difficult. This is my first time using it, right? They only find me, Doug. You, you, you can get away with calling it whatever you want. As long as people uh, understand we're, we, you know, they're one and the same, that's fine. But uh, they're, they're telling me that I, I have to get it right before the end of the quarter. So I'm doing well, I think. I, you know, as I said, only a couple of mistakes a week. So I'm down to a, a dull war. The toughest part is when people from the outside come in and say, okay, well, I, I know you guys is this name. I'm just going to keep using it. So that, <laughs> that makes it confusing for somebody who came into the situation later. They're like, well, wait a minute, which one is which? Exactly. exactly. Well, I still call Citrix, uh, whatever they call it nowadays, Metaframe. So <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that's like, that's when you know the generation of folks. I, I worked for a company that um, got acquired by HP, but we were moved into the old digital equipment um, headquarters in Marlboro, Massachusetts a long time ago. Um, so you could always tell which generation people were from. If they're still willing their, their uh, deck or digital badges, then you knew those folks had been around a long time because yeah. um, they had gone through a couple acquisitions. So same thing. Yeah, same thing for us. It's like, okay, which, which generation are we talking about here and which initials should I be using today? You got it. You got it. You got it. It's hard to keep up with it all, but this, yeah, well, yeah, this then everybody, awesome. everybody loves their three letter acronym, right? So it's still, you know, it's still a point where you, even in a new company uh, for us, for NetApp, where there's a lot of three letter acronyms and we're constantly going and looking stuff up because like, okay, that, that, I don't, I don't know if that's a product name, a group name, a process name. What, what is that? You know, what is that supposed to mean? Um, and we've, you know, we've gotten education on how many different ways you could put three letters together. I, I tell you, I just the same way, to be honest with you. So when I came in this, we have LMS, uh, uh, I am, uh, uh, I can't even think of UMS, IJOS, uh, uh, ICG, everything is the three letter acronym to us. And it's just like, wait a second. In fact, uh, I, we actually created because a bunch of people joined about when I did and, and, uh, created a chart to try to, to table, to keep up with it all. And, uh, yeah, it's yeah, I do have that as a, um, in my virtual desktop, um, I have that as a bookmark page. It's like, okay, yeah. here's the glossary and the, the link to all the documentation pages. Because that's one thing that's nice about NetApp being an, an, an old school, I'll call it an old school technology company. They've been around for decades on the storage side and, and, and they're very especially because they have uh, large enterprise customers, government customers in, in various countries. The documentation is very um, uh, in-depth. Uh, so you get, you, you can get everything you want to know about this. And in fact, that's one of our projects right now is we're taking our, um, for those who are familiar with the Cloud Jumper world, we have a documentation site called Flight School. So Flight School is being uh, um, integrated into the, the documentation site for the cloud side of NetApp. Um, it's, just, it's just interesting to see how they fit everything together. And then um, there's parts of a documentation site you don't even think about until you're part of a company that's been doing it for a couple of decades or three decades or whatever it's been. And then you're like, oh yeah, it'd be great for us to have a section on that because we never thought of it that way. Um, but if you're gonna do a compliance-based uh, product, you, you typically have to have all that stuff covered. So um, I guess it's uh, another thing of, you know, startup matures into big company um, process, but it's been interesting to see some of the pieces get put together. That's very cool. That's very cool. As an old engineer, I absolutely adore documentation. So, uh, yeah, there's guys out there that are just like, you know, don't, don't talk to me. Just don't give me the demo. Let me just read through the documentation and, and yeah. find my way myself. That's how I learn and evaluate. Right. And that's, yeah, yeah. there's still a very large group of engineers, you know, software engineers and hardware engineers out there that l learn that way and, 
and like to get, you know, develop their ex expertise that way, because then they can take all the, you know, they call it marketing fluff. You know, that's, yeah. that's nice. You guys are saying all those things, but I want to see how it actually works and whether the documentation says it works that way before I believe you. So yeah. you know, there is, there is that, uh, that, that uh, set of a subset of, of people in our industry that um, as you, you know, as you mentioned, go back, you know, three or four decades of, okay, that's, you know, that's allegedly how it works, but let me put it to, you know, in the practice and I'll use the documentation to get there. You got it. You got it. I actually, whenever I did a, a, a test a product or play with a product or learn a product, whatever you want to call it, I actually don't read the documentation. I just try to figure it out. Oh, and okay. then, I, then I fail miserably. And then I go <laughs> through the documentation. <laughs> then I'm like, oh, that's the step I missed. And then that's I'm talking to I somebody, it. right? And they say, oh, I got this problem. Oh, well, you need to do this. Well, how do you know that? I didn't read the <laughs> documentation either. Yes, yeah, the tripwire approach, right? I, yeah, I, I went through all those tripwires and blew a lot of stuff up before I figured out that maybe that's not the right way to do it. And yeah, now I have the right way to do it. I can tell you what, what, where you've wandered off course. Yeah, you got it. If I have the time, that's how I do it. So uh, let's see if I can use the name. So uh, how does virtual desktop services uh, integrate with the other NetApp products like uh, NetApp Files and Cloud Insights? Um, so I think on the uh, Azure NetApp files, we're um, our 5.4 release, which is due out next week. I'm sorry, this week, uh, 626. So uh, we're coming up um, and uh, we have a full end-to-end -end provisioning capability for that. So if you don't have Azure NetApp files, uh, our product will create the capacity pool and the volumes for that and then configure it correctly for things like FS Logics containers. So you don't have to do any further configuration. We do the networking. Um, the only thing we have to do is get it whitelisted, but um, as they say in the business, we know people now who can whitelist very rapidly for us in here inside of NetApp uh, for Azure NetApp files. Um, so that, that one's pretty much done. I would say the, um, the Cloud Insights piece, we are able now to deploy what we call side-by-side. -side, so we can take our product and create an instance that mirrors our product. And the next step uh, that we're working on right now for our next release is to do that uh, provisioning of a new cloud Insight um, tenant if you don't have it. And then we'll uh, be uh, collecting data uh, from both our API, from the Azure and uh, Google APIs. Uh, and then um, we'll be using a third party uh, agent called Telegraph, which is pretty popular in the monitoring field. Uh, that will allow us to collect anything on the performance monitor side. So the combination of those three data sets is what's going to be in the data collection side. And then we're working out what we're going to bring back into the into the VDS UI itself, because we think there's probably some context that we can provide to that data. So that one's coming along pretty well. And then there's um, on the uh, cloud volume service, uh, cloud volumes on tap, there's a number of NetApp products that run in different clouds. Uh, and we're using, uh, we have a, a common product called Cloud Manager that allows us to integrate to all of those data layers. Uh, so we'll be doing something similar to what we did with ANF um, with those products as well, using Cloud Manager as the, the single interface point so that if people want us to deploy the storage around EUC, we can do that. Um, and in any of these cases, if any of those elements already exist, uh, we have the capability to say, okay, just give us the UNC path for those. And we'll, um, we'll use that as the basis for targeting things like user profiles, personal folders, um, any, any of the application data, the share are created automatically all we need is that that smb volume and we're good to go that's great that's great so uh from the folks over at microsoft uh, wvd arm is now in the market how does that change or and or complement what you guys are doing with with vds um we we think there's some significant improvements there uh having it moved to the resource manager uh, means that we're now using the main you know components and permission structure of all of Azure. Uh, it also means that we've simplified now the consent step, um, which was famous for that white, white web page where you went and put your, you know, your uh, tenant ID into the, uh, into the page to get it to authenticate. Um, all those steps are eliminated in our uh, version 5.4 that we're, you know, that's coming out at the end of the week. Um, those pieces are all um, automated now, so we don't have to worry about that piece. Um, and then there's nice little um, things I think everybody's been um, looking at in the public preview, things like using security groups from AD, uh, Azure AD to, to populate our app groups. Um, that step is, I think, is a welcome uh, addition so that we can do it at, in bulk, which is typically how people manage security. Um, dedicated machines within the same pool, um, you know, having the access to do that directly, I think, is very helpful. Um, so we see it as additive. We, you know, fully expect WVD to continue to evolve as a product. Um, I think going to ARM was a necessary step so that things like uh, the diagnostics and permission sets, um, applying rules to the, the control uh, area of the uh, Azure part of the environment, all those pieces are very important to, to lay the framework, uh, uh, the foundation for um, uh, changes in the application stack as they're as they're coming along. Um, I think there's pieces of this that sort of were necessary to get done. We see it as sort of a changing a part of the foundation out um, as uh, as a necessary step to enabling some more functionality down the road. Um, from our side, from the VDS side, it doesn't change much of what we do because we're you know, in the end, we're an automation platform um, and we just change the API calls uh, a little bit. 
to support greater functionality, uh, but then allows us to have the same basis for um, doing the rest of the stuff that we do, provide the network, the storage, the application lifecycle management, uh, help uh, customers set policy, uh, execute um, scripts from our scripted events environment to manage the, the ongoing environment. All the steps that we typically do today don't change much. It just means that we have better access and we have a better security story uh, together with Microsoft on, okay, this is the role and using computing is in this particular security box um, and we're not you know, venturing outside of that. Makes, makes total sense, makes total sense. So um, we discussed this one earlier, uh, sort of work from home, you know, uh, work from home and some of the changes there, but maybe we can talk a bit about some uh, scenarios. Um, you know, what, what scenarios should factor into planning when, when companies are thinking about changing from, you know, on-prem to work from home, work from anywhere? Um, yeah, good question. I think, um, so we talked about the, the remote work. I think we're also seeing um, uh, what we could do, you know, there, there are situations where, companies are using folks who are not maybe full employees. They're either contract workers or they come from an outside consulting firm. Um, so they, you know, they, they want to provide limited access to a subset of applications and data, but they, they also don't want to um, create a, a full identity for that, uh, for that user. So I think that that's one of the considerations. Um, the other pieces we talked about is the mobility, you know, working from different places, either in a facility, working different uh, time uh, shifts and things like that. Uh, so all those on the requirement side have sort of broadened the, the potential use cases for virtual desktop. Uh, but then on the storage side, um, I'm sorry, on the VDS side, we have to you know, think about uh, the infrastructure and the choices we make on the, uh, on the first the deployment and the management side. And we talked about, uh, a little bit about the storage element. I think that's important. Um, figuring out how your network um, is going to be laid out is one of the challenges we see on a repeated basis. People sort of said, okay, I want to extend my existing infrastructure and my uh, IT footprint into Azure or Google or one of those places. Um, that means we also have to be aware that there are some subnets on the on-prem or private data center side that might conflict with what we're laying down for end user computing. So making sure the wiring is, is, uh, uh, is sound is also a big step. Um, and I think one of the more important pieces is, okay, when I have users and I ask them for login information, right? What's their identity? How is that translating across the different environments? Does that work if I'm coming in from a tablet or, or a different device? Um, so making sure that um, while we put all these pieces together, we're not asking the user base to, to learn six different methods for getting to an application because that'll just sure. frustrate them. Sure. Um, and then the last piece is we have to be aware that um, at, while these virtual desktop environments are definitely more secure, um, they're accessible when we do it right from almost anywhere. So those are good things. We also want to make sure the users have a good experience, right? It's a good step forward that WVD introduced Windows 10 as our base OS because now users are just logging in and look, looks like Windows 10, looks like my laptop, looks like my desktop. Um, so that's good, but we want to make sure the performance um, also meets those um, those expectations because if it's really laggy and slow, uh, then users are going to get frustrated and it will um, you know, sort of disqualify the solution regardless of um, of the other strengths um, when they get a chance to go back to, to working on a physical device if, if that happens in the you know short to medium term. Very interesting. You know, I want to ask you a, sort of an off the off the record, uh, not off the record. It is on the record. We're recording, but <laughs> off, side off the, question. Off topic so, question, sure. Yeah, off topic. There there we go. It's a Monday for me, and my brain isn't quite there yet. But uh, that it's always said, correlated to coffee, Doug. It's always correlated how much coffee has been consumed you know, and has it taken effect yet. To be honest with you, I don't think I've had any coffee today. My wife is on vacation. And oh, see, totally that's the problem messed, there. It yeah. totally messed me up. So uh, that being said, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about WVD and, and uh, it's sort of interesting at Summit this year in January, Citrix Summit, I, I went around and asked a bunch of people, hey, what do you think about WVD? And, and I figured, you know, it's brand new, you know, the Microsoft is bringing this to market and people would say, oh, I'm really interested in, in it, but, you know, we're going to wait, what have you, right, or, or see what it what I found was that everyone was extremely interested. You know, we're moving this way. You know, the customers are extremely excited. The POCs are everywhere. And then, of course, then COVID comes around, which changes everything, right? But what are you seeing, uh, uh, you know, in the in the, the field, in the, the customers? What are they saying about WVD? I think, I, I, I think there's a big... Um maybe not big, but there's a, there's a noticeable separation between customers that have already been in the virtual desktop world. Sure. Um, maybe they ran on RDS or Citrix or, or VMware Horizon. Um, those folks tend to be a little bit more, I'm happy with where I am, you know, warts and all, you know, the, every solution has its strengths and weaknesses. They're more in a wait and see mode in a lot of cases, unless there's a contractual issue or if they have devices that are coming offline, whatever, there's not a motivating driver. They're going to, they're going to let, let uh, I think that'd be good point. Sure. A little bit, but then there's a whole group of people who are like, Oh, okay. Now that it's windows 10 and, and COVID came along and said, okay, you have no choice. You have to figure out a way to do this. 
I think they're much more open to seeing how this is done, especially because if you think about it, Microsoft did rethink some of the elements of this, right? The gateway is, is obscured to some extent um, from a security perspective. Um, the scaling, which used to be a big deal for us. I mean, we spent a lot of years on the RDS and even the Citrix platform before that, trying to figure out ways to make the firewall and the load balancers and networking and all that needed to be scalable and secure and all that. Microsoft taking on those responsibilities means that's, you know, part of the complexity is now in Microsoft's side of the ledger. So you can run a lot more um, capability without having as much responsibility. I think that's sort of broadened you know, made it more mainstream to, to look at virtual desktop. And I think those people are more open to WVD, but we have customers that are very happy on Google, um, AWS, uh, private, you know, VMware, vSphere environments. Uh, they, you know, they've, they've established a working pattern. They've done the security audit. You know, it fits into their construction. I don't, I, I don't think that they, they feel any pressure to, to move just because it's the, the new shiny object. Um, so I think that's how I see the, you know, the, the universe breaking down. Um, and there's also affinity, right? If you're a, if you're a G Suite customer um, and you're using Google identity, probably doesn't make sense to then inherit the WVD um, authentication structure and, and go there. And maybe there's a, you know, maybe there's a bigger, more important workload running in Google that you don't want to necessarily move off of. So <clears throat> well, I think WVD does influence um, decisions, especially if you're a Microsoft 365 customer. I do think that there's other use cases and other established solutions that'll probably have some longevity, um, even as we uh, see the evolution towards these sort of cloud native solutions um, that you know, started, you know, started with a different perspective. It's service-based, it's cloud-based versus component and, and uh, physical machine-based back to the old days. Um, so I think there's a different um, perspective, but I think there's also a different requirement set from the potential customer base. Makes sense. That's a great answer. Great answer. Um, well, we're moving to the last couple questions, and those are always competition and future. So we'll start off with competition. Um, you know, why should someone care about what you guys are doing, what NetApp is doing, uh, versus let's say maybe going just native WV, WVD, for example, or you know, uh, somebody else? Why why should they care? Yeah, I think um, we talked a little bit about the comprehensive nature of what we're doing. Um, I think it's one thing to talk about the virtual machines, which are at the core of virtual desktop solutions, but then you have to worry about storage, networking, applications. Um, all of those components make up what we call a complete virtual desktop. And we feel VDS does the best job of, of giving administrators the capability to do all those pieces. Um, and Microsoft, you know, not to criticize the, the mechanism that they're using, but Azure is a service-driven business and framework, right? They want you to take different services, combine those to create your, uh, the solution for your particular use case. We just feel that we provide enough value to, to put all the pieces together that you need and then give you the ability to manage it going forward because it does, like, unlike other solutions, end user computing changes over time. People come and go, companies get acquired like we did. Um, and the environment changes, the application versions rev. You have to make sure that you can you cover all the pieces of that. And I think, you know, Azure, um, as a overall structure makes a lot of sense because there's people who want to do things differently. But if you're just trying to do a virtual desktop solution, letting us put the pieces together for you makes a lot of sense. Um, I think there is a difference in philosophy uh, from that perspective. Uh, Citrix and VMware Horizon, as we both know, um, are using their own component sets in the Azure cloud. Um, so I, I just don't see how those are going to be compatible for a long time. Uh, I think there's a um, there's obviously a user base for both those companies, and they have um, a well-earned reputation for some of those components. But I think there's a choice pattern there to say, okay, if I'm going to go you know, native Azure for all of my stuff, uh, does that make sense a year from now, two years from now, as Microsoft adds capabilities to the WVD side that are not compatible with, with a Citrix or a Horizon uh, type component? So I think that's a, a decision point for a lot of companies that um, was on an interesting call last week where they said, you know, I, I, I really... You know, thanks for the demo. Thanks for telling us where everybody is today. But let's be honest, we're making a decision for six months from now, for a year from now, where are you guys, you know, VDS going to be? Where's WVD going to be versus a Citrix or Horizon? Um, you know, what does that environment look like? Um, because it's not going to stay static on anybody's part and they want to sort of know where the, the roads diverge. So, sure. um, you know, from our perspective, we think we have an advantage of being native with the, the Microsoft components. We get to take advantage of all the improvements there. But at the same time, we think it's um, important to be able to give customers the ability to combine some of those Azure pieces without having to know how to do all the wiring underneath yourself. Makes sense. Makes sense. And then the last question for you is uh, future. You know, where are you guys going with this? What can we expect from you in the future? Um, I think we're, uh, as I said, sort of at the top of that applica application driven infrastructure concept that there's a lot of optimization to be done in the, in the clouds. Um, there's a lot of folks who are going to um, stay what I call in hybrid mode. They're, they're going to migrate some work workloads to the cloud. Some are probably going to stay in a private data center. Um, some will stay on-prem. Um, and I think 
we're taking advantage of the NetApp unique capability of spanning those environments, and we're going to build on that. Um, we think that monitoring, as I said, um, is going to become more and more important. And I, I brought in the, you know, the phrasing of monitoring to using the data that we get from the environment to either settle um, uh, or, or help troubleshoot resolve an end user's problem uh, all the way through, you know, am I really spending the right amount of money in Azure and Google and AWS uh, for the solution? Because we've moved to that operational expense model. That's a great change in a lot of people's mind, but it's only great if you've, you've made sure that that's not a, you know, as big a bill as it was when we used to buy this stuff or lease it for three years. Um, so we're going to focus a lot on the, um, on the ability to provide that feedback, feedback to uh, administrators and feedback to the business side of, of end user computing. Um, and the other piece we think is that, you know, application lifecycle and, and the management of that installs, updates, uh, changing config configurations, assignments, and entitlements to users. Um, we're seeing a, a next generation. So if you think about MSIX app attach, you think about the new Winget utility, um, a lot of those capabilities are something that um, I think are going to make it a lot easier for us to not have the uh, time-consuming portion of managing the applications in the virtual desktop environments. Uh, you also see that, you know, with SCCM joining Intune to become Endpoint Manager, that next evolution is something we think is going to impact the EUC market, and, and we feel we can add some capability there uh, to take advantage of those new features at the same time, you know, not add complexity to the situation, because that's a um, that you know that piece of it is is got the every opportunity to become another complex 35 page manual to how to fit it in. We we definitely want to don't want to go there. And then I think on the big picture piece for the NAP side, um, I mentioned the spot, you know, the intent to acquire a spot. Um, we think optimization across the cloud is going to become a really big subject, and we we do think we have some capability on the VDS product side to to bring that to market as well, because people are going to try and manage these environments, um, and everybody's going to have their uh, their marketing information about how you should use them and, and where you should use them. Uh, but it's one thing to, to market it. It's another thing to show uh, in that big sort of feedback cycle that, hey, I saved you this amount of money, or you didn't have to have those three machines on, or you could have done storage in a different way to either improve performance or to not use as much storage, all those types of things. We, you know, we become a, um, a useful tool to interpret the application need all the way down into those core service layers, storage and compute and places like that. That's great. Mike, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I hope you did. And I hope all those listening did too, of course. Uh, yeah, great. I'd love yeah. To, yeah, I'd love to have you back on in the future and, you know, sort of catch up and, and you know, how the next six months went or something like that. So please keep us in your mind and, and thank you again. And, and one, more, one more question. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask this one. And that is uh, if somebody wanted to learn more, what do they need to do? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, like every big company now, uh, NetApp has uh, is broken down into in parts. So if you go to uh, cloud.netapp.com, uh, the virtual desktop service uh, tile is right on that page. Um, and that will uh, get you to um, both a little bit of information about the product, but also an access point to ask somebody for, uh, for contact uh, to maybe see a demonstration or talk about um, your particular requirements or, or project. Okay, that concludes another episode of DABCC Radio. As always, I want to thank my guest for today, Mike Walsh from NetApp. Thank you so much, buddy. I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot, and I hope everyone out there listening learned a lot, too. It's really neat what the folks in NetApp are doing with the Cloud Jumper acquisition and, in general, what they're doing over there with Azure and Google Cloud and, well, all the different things he talked about. So, uh, really neat company. I've been a fan of NetApp for a long time. Uh, like I said, I used to have a friend that work there which sort of introduced me to it uh in a little bit deeper way than um than i would have otherwise so neat stuff neat technology uh definitely future uh futuristic stuff you know wvd is is wow is all i can say it's really taking the world by storm and then some so on that note uh thank you all for listening to dabcc radio i hope you enjoyed the episode uh if not please let me know uh, if you did, please tell a friend. And, uh, you know, what do I say? But um, I hope you guys are all doing well. Enjoy the summer, but stay away from people, please. You know, come on. I'm all for going out. But I like to say, if you need a hammer, go to the hammer store, buy your hammer, and then come on home. Definitely spend your money. It keeps the economy going, which is a great thing. Uh, but then, you know, head on home and spend time with your wife, your kids, your husband, your neighbors. Well, not as much your neighbors. Well, you probably know them quite well. They're probably just like you. So, anyway, preach it over. 
Guys, thank you so much for listening to the ABCC Radio. I really enjoy doing this. I'm so glad I, I started the podcast back up after you know taking a, a long hiatus from it. And we have many more in the hopper. In fact, I have, looking at my calendar, I have three more just scheduled and some really great guests. So if you'd like to be on the show, please let me know. Brown at IGEL.com or dbrown at dabcc.com. And I would love to have you on. Um, yeah, what else do I say except for thanks for listening to DABCC Radio. DABCC. DABC. Say it again, DABCC. D-A-B-C. Can you say it again? D-A-B-C-C. D-A-B-B-C. How about D-A-B-C-C? D-A-B-B-C. D-A-B-C-C. 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 D-A-B-C-C.